welcome to another episode of the Bridging Chicago podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, you can go to www.bridgingchicago.com to find all five seasons of the podcast. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter, where our handle is at Bridging Chicago, and on LinkedIn by searching Bridging Chicago. I am really excited because we're finally getting back to some in-person uh, interviews, and um, it's always better in person seeing someone face to face. It makes such a huge difference. Um, and so I'm here today with Rama of 210 Design House, and this space is beautiful, first of all. Thanks. Amazing space. You have done a wonderful job here. But um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself and how yeah. you ended up here in Chicago? I mean, Rama Danuri, so I'm president and owner of 210 Design House. Um, I was born in Chicago. Oh, okay. Um, born in Chicago, spent my grade school, I was in grade school here. Yeah. Then I spent about eight years in India in between. Okay. Came back, uh, did medical school, did residency in Cook County Hospital and surgery. Wow. Was practicing in Elmhurst and Hinsdale. During that time, during residency, we kind of started, I had two years of research did. And my parents at the time, coincidentally, my parents immigrated here in the late 50s. Okay. My dad was an engineer, actually his master's in nuclear engineering. And, but he always wanted to kind of go back to India. He had this thing of going back and he wanted to do something there. And this was around the time I was doing research and he went back and he was looking at granite marble. So he was kind of getting into that business. Interesting. So I was kind of helping him out and said, hey, you know, if I'm here, I'll do something for more than downtown. And, yeah. And you know, when you're young and naive, you think you can start anything. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, what the hell? I can start this. I'm a surgeon. I can do anything. Yeah. And so we kind of stumbled upon it about 25 wow. years ago. Wow. And they kind of, over the years, evolved. Uh, and now we are up here. Yeah. It's always interesting talking to people who are from Chicago because their Chicago stories are always really cool. And I think that we, Chicago is famous for its neighborhoods. We know that different neighborhoods kind of take on different lifestyles and have evolved with the city over time. Um, but what neighborhood did you grow up in and what your, what was your neighborhood? Like? You know, I grew up actually in the suburbs. Okay. You know, in uh, Forest Park. Oh, so Park pretty close. And then Oak Park. Yeah. And then Oak Brook. It's almost like this classic migration of immigrant family. You yeah. know, you start off my parents, my dad did his master's at the uh, University of Minnesota. Then came back to Chicago, started his first job. Uh, then kind of had this outward migration as you kind of basically go in affluence. Yeah. Move out of the suburbs. And then from there, now, of course, we all live downtown. Yeah. But I think that's kind of been that outward migration back in. One thing that I often hear from um, children of immigrant parents is how hard they had to work growing up. Uh, I think the, the mentality of the uh, immigrant parent is very like, you work very hard, you uh, get good grades, you basically work to set yourself up for later in life. Is that something that you experienced when you were young? Well, yeah, I think my parents always worked hard. Yeah. And I think part of the, I think the immigrant experience is that you're here, you have to make it. Mm. And I think that's kind of common to most immigrants. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, so doing multiple things was just normal. Yeah. You know, so I think you worked hard, you watched, set by example, people working hard. It's like, well, so should you. So yeah. I think, you yeah. know, so there's like, no time for sliding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, being a surgeon and doing your residency at Cook County Hospital, which I found out was the hospital where they filmed, or at least where it was supposedly filmed, um, ER, right? Yeah, ER. So ER is based on County. Okay. And when I was a resident, they were actually shooting it. Oh, wow. And those guys. Okay. <laughs> so you see Clooney and those guys hanging out. But it was based on, well, it actually, did, they shot a lot of the ER actually in the University of Illinois. Yeah. Like, you see the train tracks and stuff, it's actually U of I. Okay. Which is not too far from there. Okay. But it was based on Cook County Hospital. And uh, actually, BBC did a documentary called The Real ER, where they actually shot in the hospital. Oh, in so, yeah. Okay. That would be really interesting because, like, I, I work at a law firm and people are always asking me, oh, have you seen Suits? Like, have you seen this show? Is it like that? And <laughs> the the legal field is a lot different than what I thought it was going to be going into it. And so I assume the medical field is much the same way. Yeah. I mean, I don't think everybody's screaming every time you say that <laughs> after the first 50, I think you get used to it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, if you could get in there and just kind of see around a little <laughs> bit what it would be like. Um, what, uh, let me ask you this. So you said you spent eight years in India. Uh -huh. So 
How has that culture changed for you? Because even though your family is Indian, like I'm not having been there before then, um, but here in the Chicago area, what was that culture change for you like? And um, I mean, going back and forth, it has to be a little yeah, different. I think it was, for me, it was great because I think part of it is my grandparents are still there. Okay. And I think, so I spent eight years in school, so it's kind of formal years. Yeah. So you can actually understand the country and the language and the people. So if I go back right now, I can fit in very quickly. Yeah. Because I've actually spent a significant amount of time. Oh, wow. Okay. So I think you can understand it better. So I think I was fortunate. Yeah. I know a lot of folks who are first generation never went back till they were adults. Mm. And they have a tough time fitting back in there. Yeah. And I think for me, I was fortunate. So it kind of, I think having one foot here, one foot there, you kind of see both sides of it. Yeah. Which is great. I was born in Mexico, but I came here when I was super young, so I don't really remember it. Right, so I can actually drop it and I can land and start speaking the language and cursing, and they're like, "Well, <laughs> this guy's local." Yeah, they're so like, "Oh, he could be from down the street." Yeah, so. yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, I mean, I love Chicago because it's such a a true melting pot of people, yeah. and um, you see zip codes here that are so diverse, and and you get so many different languages spoken, you can get so many different kinds of foods. I think it's what makes it really special. I mean, at Cook County Hospital, I think we had, I don't think number, maybe 20 some interpreters yeah. on call. Wow. Because you'd have patients who would have to communicate with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you had somebody that, on the phone you could call or were there in person. Yeah. I think it reflects the diversity of the city. Switching over from being a surgeon, working in the medical field, to doing design work and working in cabinetry. You've been in cabinetry for over 25 years, yeah, right? 25 years now. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, it's such a cool thing, that the cabinetry and carpentry, and what you're able to create is so cool. But what was that like for you? Was there a lot of stress there, anxiety, or was it a pretty seamless transition? You know, again, when you're young, you think you can do anything. So yeah. you're like, oh, what the hell? Let's sign the lease. Yeah. Oh, now what? <laughs> so I think it kind of started off really as, Kind of being able to be part of a family business still, which okay. is kind of the incentive. Yeah. But I think as this grew, we kind of grew away from it. So now it's our own standalone business. And it's been fascinating because our product, our main product comes from Italy, a product called Sanero. So it's mm -hmm. been around for 70 years, 75 mm -hmm. years now. And it's, and we kind of pretty much by accident stumbled into the owner. We had dinner. We decided to work together. They had a place in the Merchandise Mart those days. So we took that over. But it's been a great journey to go to Italy and you get to go there for three, four months and yeah. you kind of see some really great innovation. Again, family-owned businesses over there. Yeah. And partnering to do some really large towers in Chicago. So we've done 100 story buildings, we're just finishing 100 story building in St. Regis. Wow. Which 25 years ago, people didn't even comprehend you could do a high design, big building. Yeah. And so I think that's been a great journey because I have a great team who are fantastic at understanding what those are. St. Regis here on the river. Yeah. On the yeah. River. I stayed in the same region in Hawaii and it was, I mean, it's like every detail is thought out. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's, it took us from being to end about seven years. So yeah. we're just finishing it now. We started drawing seven years ago. Wow. So Snedero is the, the company, the cabinetry company yeah. that you... the brand. Yeah. Okay. And so what we're seeing around here... And this is Snedero. So we have on the third floor, there's a company out of Pennsylvania called Clean and Fancy. Okay. Very traditional. Then we also have, you know, furniture, uh, and you know, closets, uh, bathroom lines, each one specialized in its own way. And yeah. each one where over the years, know the owners, met the owners, good relationships. So it's kind of been a really cool, fun journey. Yeah. What does it feel like for you when you get done designing these projects and you see them built and you see the, the way people are using them, the way people are interacting with your product? How does that feel like? It's great. And you know, I tell my developer friends and contractors sometimes, it's pretty stressful in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, if you look at again, you know, the St. Regis, which used to be called the Wanda Vista, started seven years ago, you know, went through pandemics and ups and downs. Yeah. And, you know, they had a few issues, but it's a hundred story building that's going to stand there for 20, 30, 50 years. Right. I mean, these are like modern day pyramids. Right. And I, and I think to sit back, that's fun because, you know, I'm not, I have a design team who does the actual design. For me, it's more logistics, the business part of it, understanding how to get it done, mm -hmm. which is as important sometimes on drawing it just because at the end, it is yeah. a business somebody has to be able to deliver it. Right. I mean, yeah, that's a great point is that you can design something yeah. that looks great, but it has to be usable. Yes. It has to be realistic too. 
and has to be executable. Yeah. Otherwise, people hate you. Do you, you do you work with a lot of different people when you're designing? You work with uh, like architects and yeah. contractors and a lot of different. So groups. we're so we have two sides to our company. One is a retail. Okay. Meaning one off homeowner walks in. Okay. Depending on their team, sometimes they'll have an architect in the contract room work with them. And in that case, depending on how much they want from us, we can do more or less depending on exactly what their team looks like. Yeah. Then the really big towers, it's an entire, I mean, it's a huge multiple process of multiple layers of designers and contractors and subcontractors yeah. and you know, the plumbing guys, electric. I mean, everybody has to work together to make it happen because we have to get our product from Italy to time it into a wow. building. And so there is a lot of logistics and, uh, a lot of coordination yeah. <laughs> to get it done on time. Well, especially now where we have seen supply chain issues yeah. where the timing of stuff, we just don't know. So has that been difficult for you? It has, but I think today, for example, I had a group we're talking to. It, it, we have to mitigate it. We have, yeah. we, that's my job. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm in factories every two, three months going down there and run Zoom calls every day. And you can't, you can't plan ahead. You know, we have, we're doing something right now in Nashville, for example, where they were worried about this. It's like, and you want it ahead of time. So we actually manufactured it ahead of time and shipped it in. So mm. we accounted for the delays in shipping, but we're right on time now. Yeah. So I do think if you plan for it, and you have, that's what my job is. Yeah. Is to plan for it. Yeah. And it can happen. Well, and I'm sure that homeowners or uh, owners of buildings feel a lot more at ease when they know that you're thinking about these things. So even if I don't think about it, you're thinking about it. Yeah, that's our first thought. <laughs> yeah, when somebody walks in, it's like, what do you want it exactly? Let's, let's work backwards. Yeah. And if you do, you can mitigate most issues. Not okay. all of them, of course. So, people, when they come to you, are trusting you with a very important piece of their life. Yeah. Not just where they're going to live, but where they're going to raise their families, where they're going to do their work now. A lot of people working yeah. from home. Um, with that sort of level of responsibility, how do you tackle a project knowing that it's not just designing a space for people, it's designing their home? And I think this becomes very personal. Yeah. I think that's also becomes very emotional for the client. Mm, yeah. So it is really important to think to kind of, and we have designers who are outstanding, been at those 27 years, to not just listen, but to shape the expectations. Yeah. So they are met and people walking in understand it. Yeah. I think it's easy to just say, yeah, sure. Yeah. And then disappoint folks. So I think our job is really to keep everything even and make sure people understand what they're getting into. Because besides the final product at the end where they have to live in, even the journey, mm. it could be fun or it could be painful. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's part of our task is to make sure that, you know, I think the advantage of being for 25 years in the industry, we've probably pretty much seen almost everything. So I do think, <laughs> you know, it enables us to prepare you know, our clients more, and I think we kind of really harp on the, although it sounds non-romantic, the practical part of this, yeah. of the design versus the creative part, which is great, but we really kind of, at least for me, I kind of really, we have meetings every week and we just keep talking about the practical part, about yeah. shipping, about getting it on time, who's going to be there, okay. which I think makes the whole project go well. And if you have a good experience, if you build this space out and you had a great experience doing it, I think you enjoy it more. Yeah. You know, and I think for us that we built this building out, I had some really good friends who helped me. And we really enjoyed it from day one because yeah. it was the memories of good memories. Yeah. And the process of good process. So. I mean, uh, the space here is amazing. I think that when you put a story behind it, it just makes it that much more special. Exactly. And I think that, so see, we've kind of, and I always tell our clients too, it's like, you know, we use everything we sell. Yeah. And that's, we had a choice, for example, as an entrepreneur. I could have picked different lines. Yeah. So I, why did I pick Snyder? Why did I, so that's part of what we're telling our clients. Yeah. We're asking you to pick because, and we've done it ourselves. We've demonstrated faith in by picking it ourselves. Yeah. And so, for example, we have a new line of furniture called Arflex, where I've known the owner for 20 years. Great folks outside Milan make some really iconic pieces. And it's kind of a personal relationship. If I told him, hey, this thing can come, come out, but I can fix it. Because, yeah. and I think that's kind of what we want for our clients too. Yeah, and I'd love to hear about the rest of the staff here because I think you like picking the people that you work alongside is really yeah. important. And I'm assuming they have to be people that you can connect so, with. Yeah, so I think interestingly, you know, and so we have our head of our retail side, like Brandy's been here 22 years. Oh, wow. 
Uh, Erica, who runs our project site, has been here 21 years. Yeah. Um, Alex, who's another senior designer, has been here, actually our youngest, I think he's been here six years. And and the rest of the team, too, and most of the time, and we, most of our crew who's still here, we, they start with us out of college. Mm-hmm. They start young, and I think we've trained, and I really believe in promoting from within. Okay. And I really, for me, it's really important to kind of grow people because I don't think it makes sense to hire somebody and say, oh, you're an assistant. Well, what does that mean? You're going to assist them their life? Nobody wants that. Yeah. yeah. And we don't. So we want people who really want to kind of grow yeah. understand, and watch the examples of people who have grown with us. Yeah. And so every single person who started with us has grown with us. Uh, so which is kind of like we'd like to promote from within because I think it's just, it just, I just think it kind of gives people inspiration. But I, you know, when I trained to be a surgeon, you start as a medical student, then you're an intern, then you're a resident, and then you're a surgeon, but you're progressing along that ladder. Yeah. And so I think the people who really think that way is what I like to, because I think they really aspire to that. Yeah. And it's always interesting when you see those, uh, those jobs there, it's like, okay, you're this and you're this and you're this. Yeah. And it makes sense in your head. You're like, okay, this is how I grow. And in other jobs, it, it doesn't, it's not set necessarily the same sort of ladder, but there's still so much growth that happens there. What's well, also, you know, I think you teach people with the understanding that you were there. Yeah. And so it's kind of fun when somebody young comes in and some of our older staff is teaching them. Yeah. Understanding they were there. Yeah. And you can aspire and you will because they did. Mm. You know, kind of again, I go back to my training too in residences because that's how we were when we first started. You know, the night, what do I do with this? Yeah. But by the time you're done, you know, you're a practicing surgeon. Right. And your peers taught you. My chairman used to say, I'm teaching my competition. And he was right. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but, but I think that's great. I actually enjoyed that. Yeah, I think uh, that's the healthiest competition there is yeah. where you're pushing each other to be better and you're sharing that knowledge so that and they bring stuff to the table you don't even think about. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the heartbeat of the place is so palpable. You can you can see it, you can feel it, you can hear it all around. And so it, it's like the place is alive. But um, I think in that same sentiment, the heartbeat of this particular design house is also in giving. And I know that um, giving back to the community and giving back to people is very important to, yeah. to you. So how are, what are some of the ways that you're able so to do we've that? Done you know, it is, I think, I think, especially through like Chicago, you know, it's a very diverse city. Mm-hmm. Some people are more fortunate than others, mm-hmm. right? And I think, I think if you're going to be in business, I think if you're going to be successful or have any degree of success, I think part of success has to be giving back. Yeah. So there's a few charities I'm part of. We started a charity 12 years ago called Saturday Place. In Saturday Place, there's a, there's an ex-former bear, Rashid Davis, you see the white, white receiver for them. Chicago Bears. And Rashid, when he was playing with the Bears, said, hey, you know, he himself was taken out of his situation in LA, mm-hmm. exposed to something around the uh, to grow. Yeah. And that was his ambition. Yeah. And so through a common friend we met, and he said, hey, I'd love to do this. So we formed this, you know, this uh, charity called Saturday Place, which has now grown to a 10-member board. We're all, all private, you know, guys in construction development, but we take kids from third and fourth grade who are not achieving in math and English from back to the yards of Brighton Park. And every Saturday, we tutor them in math and English at UIC. Wow. So we, they get, they get 30 extra Saturdays a month. And it's a two-year program. So we have about 60 kids at any given time. And we really realize that it's the children do. So they're starting off a grade behind mm-hmm. of their peers. By the time they finish our program, they're at or above par. Mm. And they have statistics that show that if you're not if you're not at grade level of English by the time you finish fourth grade, there's something like a 60 or 70 percent chance yeah. you won't finish high school. Yeah. And, and if you look back in the areas of Brighton Park, there's about a hundred percent chance you end up in jail wow. if you don't finish high school. So that's been our trust. And I think we and, and it's just we there's no government funding involved. There's, there's, it's just purely raising money from peers and fundraisers. In the construction development industry, which has been great. Yeah. And we're also, I'm also on the board of SOS Children's Village, which is, uh, oh, uh, we uh, interviewed them. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Tim, or, Tim or, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Tim yeah. McCormick? Yeah. So, yeah. Tim, uh, I got a chance to speak to him. So, I'm actually, I've been on the board now for about nine years. Okay. So, you know about the charity for foster yes. kids. Yes. And so, again, it's the same thing. So, they actually, I don't know if we told you, but 
they have really nice kitchens in those houses because yeah. cars we donated them. So, you know, yeah, I saw one um, in Roosevelt. Middle Village. Oh yeah, near Roosevelt. Yeah. Yeah, near Roosevelt, uh, Village in Roosevelt, another one near 75th and Parnell. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. And so I think recently we did some donations to uh, I think it was Bridging Chicago. Uh, oh, that's awesome. I think rebuilding together. Rebuilding together, so, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that was again uh, it was this older older lady who was gonna move back into her house that she was gonna take her 90-year-old mom with her. Wow. And she knew the kitchen. Yeah. So one of our colleagues in construction asked us and we're happy to donate. So I think it's you know, kitchens, kitchens and homes are such a central part of everybody's life. Yeah. And we're fortunate to do some really beautiful stuff. But I think it's also the same. So in SOS Children's Village, like in Roosevelt, the village in Roosevelt, all the kitchens we donated. Same thing at the community center and also the community center and the Chicago village. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's, I think if you're going to, I really believe that if you're going to share these, if you're going to donate something, I don't think it should be substandard. Yeah. I think it should be good stuff because you want to inspire those kids. Yeah, yeah. So what is that? So I don't, you know, so it should be, why not do something nice? Yeah. We also had a chance to interview um, an organization that they design office spaces for nonprofits. And, you know, they were sharing with us that, you know, if we're going to put something in, we, we would never put something in that we wouldn't put in our own space. Exactly. Or want to work with ourselves. Yeah. And I think it should, I mean, I think the product should not just, you know, perform a function. Yeah. Like a kitchen, you actually inspire them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you go to an SOS children's village, when you go to the village's homes, the parents, the foster parents are like, oh yeah, really nice kitchen, we like it. Like, yeah. Great. Yeah. So it's not just functional, but it's actually better. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. That's so good. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, um, you know, that's the story that people need to hear is that what you're doing here, you're, you, people aren't just coming in and saying, I want that, I want that, I want that. But they're really picking out where they're like they're going to raise their families. They're going to make cookies with their kids in the kitchens, and they're going to you know eat or you know eat pizza around the sofa for movie night. Uh, I mean, these are things that are actually going to happen in these spaces. And I think you want it to be beautiful, you want it to be functional, but most of all, you want it to be home for them. Yeah, and I think that's part of it. And so I think again, I do go back to. I mean, we're fortunate to have some really great senior designers, and really at the end of the day. If a designer listens to a client, the client designs it. Yeah. I mean, the whole one is actually designing. The designer is almost a tool to kind of a guide, to guide him to what's available to, because ultimately it is a homeowner's needs you're fulfilling. Mm. And so I think we, I think if we do that well and make the process straightforward and the experience good, I think we've fulfilled our objective. Yeah. I, I'm sure that you are. And I think that, um, it's really cool that you step outside of what you do here and you work with other organizations that are doing big work because, uh, like I said, we had a chance to, to speak with SOS and they're just amazing people. But the reality is, in way, it? Yeah. we would have very few problems. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's not that difficult. Yeah, I think the difficulty is people is getting over that feeling like your little bit isn't going to do much. But reality is that piece might be the piece of the puzzle that's missing in this other thing. And I think that's encouraging. We've had children when you were at SOS. I'm sure Tim told you we've had uh, foster children who were, over the last 25 years have a hard high school graduation rate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, go, go on to Yale or go on to, you know, at a Saturday place. You had our children who were a year be- behind when they started with us who are now got admitted to the robotics program in yeah. Illinois or so. Really cool things. And I think that, and if, if one person, if you change one person's life, that trajectory, I'm sure if you go back and look at it, changes the entire. So oh, think, absolutely. You no, know, so I think it's well worth the effort, frankly. Yeah. Well, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you do that because that's what, that's the story that we're sharing here is just how people are making a difference in their part of Chicago. Because I think that Chicago is a really amazing city, yeah. but it, it also certainly has some needs. And I think. We look to the mayor, we look to other people to, to make a change, but the reality is the change lies within us, each individual person. Yeah. And I think if you look at what's interesting, what's fascinating in the city is that besides all the news, et cetera, is if the cause is good and people trust that you're going to take care of, shepherd their money correctly, yeah. you've never had a problem raising money. Wow. It's because people are like, okay, we trust you guys. Yeah. You guys know what yeah. you're doing. And as long as you do that, it's been pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, I think that's what's great about the city. 
yeah, it's, it's good to hear that people are generous and people are helpful. I think that's what we really want to know is that, you know, people, uh, we assume people care, I think, but to think, to know that they're thoughtful and generous and ambitious is, is really cool. I think part of the problem sometimes is, you know, one of the things, like you said, is my bit doesn't help. The other part is, I'm not sure this is going to the right place. Yeah. Mm. I think when people get over that part, we find people are very generous because they all, they see it, they see the events, they watch, they see the kids. Yeah. They're like, great. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you have an amazing space here. Um, can people come here and visit the space? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Yeah. Uh, you can come by themselves or they can come to make an appointment. It's really up to them. Uh, I think people, most of the time, people just kind of walk in, kind of wander around a little bit, get some ideas. Yeah. Right. And they come back with designers or the architects, depending on what they have. Yeah, we're at 210 Design House, which is located at 210 West Illinois Street here near the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. So we're pretty close to downtown, kind of between downtown and River North. So it's definitely a design neighborhood here. Really cool stuff to see here. So you make sure if you can stop by. Um, do they need to make an appointment ahead of time? Or they no, just if they have a specific need, it may be better just so that people are available if they want right. to talk about something that's kind of a specific project. Yeah. Yeah, so you can contact them on that if you need to, but it's a really cool space to see. And then if you want to hear more about the work they're doing, as well and how you can get involved with that because there's always needs there for sure yeah is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure to know i think we're i think we're covered pretty comprehensive yeah i i really enjoyed our conversation i enjoyed learning about you and well, the design house and the work that you're doing because i think you know we don't always see that work and we don't always hear about the the nonprofit work that you're doing and the difference that you're making in the city but it's really encouraging to to hear that you're doing that. I think you'd be surprised. Yeah. But the amount of people out there who actually do good work. Yeah. You know, I think I'm always- I'm always surprised. Yeah, and I think people are, I think people's, I think heart's the right place. It's just getting them tools sometimes almost. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting because I, when I, sometimes when I ask people if they want to come on the podcast, they're like, ah, I don't really have a story to share. I don't really have anything interesting to say. And I always learn something. You know, I always hear their story, and it's it's just amazing how many people don't realize what their story can do and the difference that it can make. For sure, because I think like one like yours, where you know you have immigrant parents, you come to you you live in this area, you go back home for a time and visit there, and it's like what you've learned from multiculturalism. I think is is really cool, and I think it's really beneficial for people here. For sure, no. I think so. I think I think, like I said again, I think it's it's the, deep, the deeper you get into it, I think the more you learn. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. Well, thanks for sharing with us. I really do appreciate well, I it. it. Thank you. Um, and if you have any socials that you want to shout out and let people know where they can find you on Instagram or if you're on, yeah, of course your website. Yeah, on our website, two ten designhouse dot com. Yeah, so you can check them out at two ten designhouse dot com. Or, as always, you can stop by here at 210 West Illinois Street and check out their space. It's really awesome. And again, you can find us at www.bridgingchicago.com, where you can listen to this episode, our current season five, and our past four seasons of the podcast. So thanks again for joining us. Rama, thanks for your time again. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on the Bridging Chicago podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bridging Chicago as produced by the SATC Solutions Center. Nothing contained in this podcast shall constitute financial, investment, legal, and or professional advice. No professional relationship of any kind is created between you and the podcast host or guest. You are urged to speak with your financial, investment, or legal advisors before making any investment or legal decisions. Furthermore, the opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the opinions of SATC Solutions Center, SATC Law, or any of its employees. This podcast is created by the hosts and guests' individual capacities. All opinions on this podcast are or have been rendered based on specific facts under certain conditions and are subject to certain assumptions and may not and should not be used or relied upon for any other purpose, including but not limited to or use in or in connection with any investment purposes or legal proceeding.